So, uh, we will be finishing uh, Matthew tonight. And, um, yeah, so this is part 12 of Contradictions in the Gospels. We'll start with 2652, which is right where we ended um, before. And this is what it says in, I believe this is from the NIV, if I remember correctly. It says, put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. So there's a lot of Christians who think that uh, Christians have to be what's called pacifists. That means where you don't believe in any violence whatsoever, you know, no harm, no foul kind of stuff. You, you can't go to war, that kind of stuff. So, uh, and also a lot of a hot topic right now is Christians thinking that you can't believe in capital punishment because God is love, therefore you... There's, I guess, somehow that equates to capital punishment. So, however you stand on the capital punishment issue, um, it is important to note that God did not say anything against capital punishment, and the Bible never even hints towards Christians having to take that stance. So, if you do believe in capital pun, do not believe in capital punishment, that's totally fine. Like you're not non-Christian, as a lot of these people, like on online, for instance, will make you think. And if you don't uh, believe in capital punishment, that's totally fine too. So. Uh, let's go through just a real quick summary from the Bible. Uh, God commanded in Genesis, uh, at the, I think it's in chapter 9, he says that anybody who commits murder should themselves be killed. So that's God's first command of capital punishment. Um, he commanded punishments in the law, oftentimes result in some of them requiring death. Um, in the book of Joshua, he commanded that they go to war with Canaan and kill people. <laughs> so, I mean, obviously that's not um, nothing there. Uh, we can we could go through the rest of the Old Testament, but let's just hop down to the New Testament so you don't think I'm just getting stuff from the Old Testament. There was a Roman centurion, his name was Cornelius. Uh, he was a soldier, obviously, being a centurion, duh. Uh, and he, mur killing people was part of the game, and uh, instead God calls him a devout man. So, obviously, he was able to serve in the Roman Empire and still be counted as a devout man by God, therefore implying that you can be a devout man without being a pacifist. Um, so, go ahead. Well, okay. not just that, but murder is very much different than killing. So, like, a good example of this would be um, when somebody broke into your house. If it was at nighttime and you killed them while they were breaking into your house, it was not counted as murder because you didn't know who they were. There was a stranger in your house. But if it was in the daytime, it was counted as murder because you were able to see their face. You knew what was going on, and you killed them anyways because you got mad. <laughs> so there was a difference there. So you were like mad that they were in your house, or were you defending yourself? It, irrelevant. The, the Bible doesn't. Now, obviously, if the person was attacking you, then it wouldn't have been murder. But it, it says specifically if they're in your house, Stealing from you in daytime, then it's murder. So that kind of clarifies. Like, how you can't do anything and stealing from no, you. No, 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 no. So um, you're thinking more of modern society. No. Oh, okay. um, typically, when somebody is robbing from you and you go and approach them, they typically run. So you would have to pursue them down, fly and catch them, and then murder them. Oh, and that's okay. just a lot of work to do without a gun because you have a sword, you know. So it's like, oh, hold on, I'm going to. I'm going to get you. It's like, I don't know. So you could still arrest them, like detain them to yeah. be tried. But, you know, obviously there's a difference there. So when you went to war and killed people, that was not murder. You were either either protecting yourself, protecting your, your countrymen, or following God's commands with the war that he had sanctioned. So all those things are kind of different. Murder is kind of just like, okay, here's a good example. Nicole made me mad. Murder. Okay, versus murder, uh, Nicole is coming out with a, I mean, with a knife, and so pew, I kill her. That's different. I didn't murder her. I killed her. Right. Does that make, kind of make sense? So the, the, the Ten Commandments are talking about more specific things. So thou shalt not murder, not thou shalt not end a life for no reason whatsoever. Those are two totally different things. Now that makes sense. Okay? I agree. Oh, I thought you were going to say something. So... Uh, so what is, uh, it's important to note that what is immoral for an individual to do is not necessarily for someone else to do. So a good example of this would be that leaders in the church, right? Leaders in the church are actually tasked to do some things that normal people in the church are actually told not to do. So an example of that would be um, giving rebuke and, and discipline. Uh, the Bible says that leaders in the church 
have authority over the congregation. Well, not everybody in the congregation has authority over one another. See what I mean? And so they're tasked to do something that other people aren't supposed to do. So it's okay for them to do it, not okay for everybody to do it. So another way this could work out is average Joe, Nicole. Nicole, you're not allowed to kick people out of the church. You're not allowed to invite them to leave. (laughs) But the pastors, well, we are allowed to do that kind of stuff. And there's even biblical warrant for that. And so, and then another example, this would be in, in, I believe it's Hebrews, where he says, um, don't make it where the leaders who have authority of you over you in the church, where they have to do it with, with grumbling, but where they actually enjoy to do the job that they're doing. So don't go around making fights. Uh, causing fights, I should say. So, anyways, uh, that's just a good example there. Soldiers can fight for their country, though Christians can't fight for the church or for the gospel. So, we cannot fight somebody for the sake of spreading the gospel. Like, Muslims are allowed, they are allowed to do this. Muslims are allowed to go and fight people to get the uh, message out of the prophet. Okay, Christians are not allowed to go to war for the sake of spreading the gospel. So that would be kind of the, the, the difference there. But a Christian can serve in the army and kill big people in the army, and they don't have to, like, they're not doing anything immoral. So, in fact, the Bible talks about um, the governments as being, a, being created by God. And so when you are serving the government, unless you're doing something immoral, such as uh, in the book of Exodus where they are drowning the babies, <laughs> good example of something immoral, um, then you're not really doing anything um, bad. Even even immoral governments have, are are uh, raised up by God. Right, but that's the thing: is every government is immoral. Right, right. So the thing is, how immoral? So right. the the rule of thumb seems to be that you're supposed to follow the laws and pray for the leaders and obey the leaders, unless it dire- that certain thing directly contrasts with what God says. So a good example of this would be in the book of Daniel, where Nebuchadnezzar says, okay, you all got to worship this idol. And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are like, yeah, no, we, we're not going to do that. And they did, they did it respectfully. They didn't do it, oh, we're standing our ground. They did it, oh, great king, we're, we're, we're obeying, you know what I mean? They, they, they bowed to him, and they were showing him, him respect and honor, and they just said, but we cannot do this thing because it would go against. So there's this idea now in America that, that Christians have to stand their ground with like this attitude of, no, I won't do that. And it's like, okay, calm down. Like, my, the big thing that makes me laugh is, um, so when there were kings around, like there are still kings, but I mean, kings and like the, the, mo- the civilized people had kings. So there was like France and uh, England, which I guess still has a monarchy. But anyways, uh, and so they would have these kings and, and some Christians made this big huff about, oh, I'm not going to bow to the king and I'm not going to kiss their hand. It's like, Daniel did it and he was called by God to like as this really righteous person. So I don't think it's that big of an issue, but whatever. Um, anyways, um, so there is a difference also between defense and aggression, which we already pointed out. So if I'm attacking Nicole versus I'm defending myself against Nicole, uh, the church should never never wield political power. This is something that is very important, and this is something that, that kind of builds on it. The church was meant to be separate from the government. It was always meant to be that. Unfortunately, in the 300s or so, uh, one, uh it's not really important history lesson, but it, it, there was kind of this big change that happened with the church, where now all of a sudden they had this big voice in in the government and stuff, and and the Roman Empire changed, and everything was was on its head, and oh, it got where it's just like what's going on, which is actually where monastic communities came from, is they well in order to preserve the truth of the gospel, we have to separate ourselves from the people. So you know, I guess a good intent, I guess, but whatever. Uh, and um, so, you know, the the separation of church and state was actually something that Christians came up with, which is funny because nowadays you would think that um, the way people talk, they always talk about it in terms like Christians trying to take over the government. And there are Christians who try to take over the government, absolutely. But we're supposed to be apart from the government. We're supposed to be, I guess you could say... Um, you know, we're supposed to submit to that higher power, and that higher power tells us to submit to our our government. So there's this whole confusion nowadays in America with what that means to be a Christian. Unless, unless the government told you to go to do something. Like in which case, you should still be respectful to them and obedient in other things, just not obedient in that thing. Mm-hmm. So, like, for instance, they say, "Hey, 
you can only have two kids from now, so you gotta kill your other kids. And I'd be like, oh, okay, that's not gonna happen. <laughs> like, it's... But if I was gonna kill, I think I know which ones I'd keep. No, I'm just kidding. I'm joking. I'm joking. Joking. <laughs> Is that a movie? Yeah, what happened to Monday? Mm-mm. It's kind of like about that concept, basically. It's a, so, it's a very dystopian situation. Oh, okay, kind of like, yeah, okay, I get you. So what we come down to is that Christians are in this awkward place. So as a Christian, our job is to forgive people, right? So somebody molests our child, okay? We have to forgive them. Now, well, hold on. You don't have to forget them. You don't have to. You don't have to separate. You don't have to make your child go back in a relationship with that person. Okay, no. <laughs> you should protect your child from that person, absolutely. But you do have to forgive them, and I'm saying this as a father. But the government still has to bring judgment. See how that works? So even while you are forgiving, you are still turning them over for for justice. So that is still something that has to happen. <coughs> and you do it for the greater good of other people's kids too that it wouldn't happen again you don't have to do it with vengeance like ha 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 but it does still need to be done I was going to say what do you think of the concept of forgiving just because you want closure for yourself um, I think there's an element to that that is true I don't think that's all that forgiveness is about I, don't, I think that if it's all about you it's not really forgiveness it can't really be forgiveness right. because it's all about you forgiveness is about restoration well you can't restore <laughs> You can't restore if it's all about you in your own head. Like that's not forgiveness. That's 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 closing out of something, and that's good. You should close out of something when you've gone through a hurt. Absolutely, you should get to a point where you let it go. Absolutely, like you know, whatever in your in your inner part being of, of forgiveness to let it go, whatever. But that's not all that forgiveness. Just because like you started the process doesn't I mean you did the whole thing. So there's still you know there should still be reconciliation between the two people as far as possible. There are exceptions to that. I'll, I'll give you a good one right off the top of my head. Something pops into my head. Gracie, let's say, is, is raped by somebody. Should she forgive the person? Yes. Does she have to go and talk to the person one-on-one? -on -one? I would highly recommend that, they, that she does not. I would highly recommend that. That sounds like a terrible idea. And it's very traumatic for her. I don't think that's a good idea. Now, this is something I greatly disagree with the Jehovah's Witness about. Well, obviously, besides doctrine, is they have it where... The people have to go one on one. So if your child was molested by somebody, they have to meet with them again. <laughs> Great idea, Jehovah's Witness. Real good idea there, guys. <laughs> like, hey, child, you've just like, been traumatized. You have to make sure else I don't know if they're. I don't know if it's one on one. I, I don't. I don't. I'm, I'm just like, no, but they do still have to talk with them. Which, yeah. as a kid, how traumatizing is that? Like, yes, this person just touched me in a way I didn't like. I didn't enjoy it, and now I have to talk to them again. Then, yeah, like, jeez. <laughs> Anyways. And be like, you have to forgive them. Right. I don't understand. I'm a child. So Romans 13 talks a lot about the place of government. And uh, especially in verse 4, um, I didn't bring my Bible in here. Nicole, would you mind looking up Romans 13, verse 4? <laughs> it, it doesn't matter. You can go NIV, ESV, NASB, any of those. Just don't do NLT. I, I want something more... Um, so, uh, God is not kill against killing in certain contexts. Uh, verse 4. Romans? Romans 13, verse 4. Okay. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. The part I want you to focus on was the part where it said that he was appointed to, to carry out the sword. God has appointed governments literally to carry on that aspect of life, the civil aspect. This is one of the reasons why it's very important that the church does not run the government. They have to be separate. The church is meant to, meant to exist for the sake of morality, for the sake of community, those kinds of things, which is very important. But when historically and, and logically, whenever a religious organization gets in contact with the government, things don't go well. I mean, a great example of this would be Hinduism, right? Hinduism is a religion that only brings pain and suffering. It never brings anything else. Like, so the, the caste system in India, that is because of Hinduism. It's, Hinduism teaches that. 
they're following Hinduism when they do the caste system, which means it's okay for your little girl to be raped as a child, which means it's okay for your little girl to be married off. That's okay under Hinduism. Like, that's not acceptable, but because Hinduism is so eh, wedded to the government in India, it's something that is going to be a problem for, well, until they stop it. So God is not against killing in certain contexts. We have this idea, especially in the more civilized world, it seems like people in less civilized places have a, have a better understanding of God in a lot of ways. And one of the ways that they do is we have this idea that God is like this cuddle bear. So like, um, for him to be loving and all this different stuff, that means he can't discipline, he can't instruct, he can't have wrath. He, he can't have any of that. He has to always be in this good, happy mood with rainbows behind him and like, hee 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 hee, and like, you know, not to ever take anything serious. And that's not God. Like, that's an image of your own creation. God is loving, yes, but he is also wrathful towards sin. Like, there, there isn't one or the other. It's yes. So, um, defending the weak oftentimes requ requires us to hurt those who are hurting others. Sometimes the greatest offense you can give to somebody is hurting the person who's, who's hurting them. Is a good a what? Defense? Right, the greatest thing you can do to, to protect against somebody being, being hurt is hurting the person who's hurting them. Um, let's say somebody is um, going into a school shooting the kids. Are you going to walk up to them and say, hey, um, I, I don't think you should do that. I would appreciate it if you don't do that. Or are you going to take them out? Lives are on the line. You got to do something to protect the kids. Do something. Do anything. Like, just stop him. Like, Makes I, sense? <laughs> something I've heard, and I don't know how true it is, but the most recent school shooting is a lot of the officers were standing around talking about not wanting to shoot the kid. Hmm. That, that's what held them back. Well, I don't know anything about that. And I don't know if those reports are I, true. I, again, like I said, I don't know how true it is, but that's what was holding them back. It's not well, wanting to shoot the kid. I, but yet he was in there shooting others. I've seen a lot of times, especially in modern times, where where they just flip it against the cops. Anything that they can say bad against right. the cops, that's what they'll do. Yes, so I don't know anything about that. I wasn't there. I didn't. I don't Very see bad. any footage. I haven't seen any footage of that happening. Um, so right now we've got hearsay. Is there any proof of that? Well, no. But there's somebody said. Reports, just no, right. Nothing to back it up. And so then there's going to be. Pretty much all the news on, on TV is going to be slanted for what they want to get across. So Fox is going to somehow get across about how people need more guns. And CNN is going to get somehow across about how cops need to be defended because that's their political agenda. Nobody's actually going to tell you what really happened. <laughs> They're going to tell you their slant on what happened. So it's hard for me to just go out to it and say, hey, this. Um, but anyways, uh, maybe they were concerned about the people standing behind the kid that they would accidentally shoot them in the process of trying to. I don't know. I don't know. And uh, so I'm gonna. I don't think we'll, ever know the truth of what happened. well, maybe if maybe if there was like some research that went on, like where we talked to the police officers, you know, uh, asked for some eyewitnesses, right. maybe saw some video surveillance, you could you could draw a, a right. wise conclusion. But without any of that, I'm not gonna like just right. say something. So, uh, in order to defend the weak person, we oftentimes have to hurt the person who's attacking, and uh, that's something that's uncomfortable, but it's something that is. True. You can't get away from the fact that sometimes life requires violence. Um, and then the last thing I, I want to say about this before we go to the next verse is that prophets talk a lot about withholding justice. A lot about withholding justice. And I don't think that they had in mind that we were supposed to be pacifists when they said, Hey, why are you guys standing and doing nothing while these people are being persecuted? I don't think that their thinking was, no, be pacifists. And, no. Are you supposed to be are you supposed to be persecuted as a Christian? Yes, you're supposed to endure persecution as a Christian. But there's a difference between being persecuted for your religious beliefs and being persecuted. Okay, here's the difference. I went to Dallas. If you guys don't know anything about Dallas, the Asians hate black people. They hate them. Like I don't know exactly why, but they hate them. And so my sister uh, is black. And so we were at this, uh, I, actually, I, I w they were at this, at this uh, market, and they took both of my white, my, my wife, white, my white wife's order, and they took my white sister's order, and then my, my black sister goes to take the order, they skip her and go to somebody else, and it was very obvious, like insanely obvious, 
they did not want to serve the black woman. It was very obvious. And uh, so, you know, that's kind of like, well, you get what I'm saying. <laughs> so the next uh, verse is, it's actually going to be in two different spots. And it's just going to, we're going to go through this insanely fast. The first part is says it in the Gospels about Judas, who's one of the twelve, who kills himself. And this is from 27.5 in, in Matthew. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. Well, then we get into Acts in chapter 1, verses 18, verse 18. And it makes it sound like that's not what happened. It says, With the payment he received for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong, his body burst open, and all his intestines spilled out. Well, see, this only makes this only wouldn't make sense for somebody who doesn't understand um, hanging and what happens as the corpse is hanging there, getting bloated. Um, so he did hang himself, yes, and then somehow either he was cut down, or the rope slipped, or the branch broke, or something. Either way, the body fell down, and when it fell down, it was it was burst open because bodies bloat when they and he's been hanging there for at least a day because he goes out in the middle of the night and hangs himself. Nobody knew about it until the next day, so at this point, his body's already a little bit bloated. So then he's out in the sun, stinking, and eventually, like, what do you think's going to happen? Have you guys ever seen a video, for instance, of uh, when an elephant dies and, and a hyena goes to, like, chew on it and stuff? It, 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 there's this moment where it pops. Or, yeah. a, or a whale. I haven't seen a whale explosion. Right. So it's, it's, all the, the, it's all similar. So you get what I'm saying. So which one is true? Well, they're both true. Um, the law says that the body... Oh, oh, th this is something else I wanted to mention. So, n these things are not at odds with each other. Prob the chances are that they both happened. Um, what I wanted to point out, though, it's interesting. In the law, it says that, um, the, that you know, you hang, you hang somebody on a tree uh, to, to uh, you know, as the, as the punishment for the certain crime. But it, it says this. It says that if the law... I'm sorry. It says that the body has to be taken down from the tree before the sun sets or the curse will return back to the land. So Jesus was removed off the cross before the sunset. But Judas, who went and hung himself, was not. And he was also hung on a tree, although he was hung with a rope and Jesus was hung, hung with nails. It still both applies to the law, implying that, th that the curse of the betrayer went back onto the, onto the betrayer, which uh, is kind of important because Judas could have turned to Jesus and he didn't. Um, so, anyways... Little things that you don't know if you don't read the law. Matthew twenty-seven thirty-seven. Uh, above his head they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Now, if you read in the four Gospels, they all say that the inscription said something different. And so you're left with this idea of, well, which one was it? Well, so there's a few things, and I'll summarize it in three quick points, okay? The inscription read different in all four Gospels because, first off, the least likely answer, which you could say, but I don't think that this is true. But I'll say it anyways. They aren't meant to be exact, just a general idea of what was said, since they all say basically the same thing. I don't think that's true, but it could have been that. So that takes us to the, the answer that I actually think is the real answer. Number two, they were from different languages, first off, and so they were being translated over. The Bible actually says that they were written in, I think it was four different languages. And then the, uh, the people at the time spoke Aramaic, but the Bible was written in Greek. So you have translation from what was written on the thing to Aramaic and then possibly into Greek if they did it that way or however they did it. Either way, there's some, there's some good chances of, of, of that. But the, the bigger issue here is that all four of the Gospels contain a fragment of the entire message. And if you read them all four together, you get the whole message. This is Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Why didn't, they all, why didn't any of them have the full inscription? I don't know. So Matthew 27, 44. Uh, in the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. So if you grew up in church, you know the story about the two people who were hung with Jesus on the crosses next to him. There was one on his left and one on his right. So if you don't didn't grow up in Sunday school, well, now you know. And uh, so if you read in Luke, it talks about the way... <laughs> that was a really, really funny sneeze. I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing at your sneeze. <laughs> It's like Troy on Community. <laughs> it reminds me of a cat. So, uh, anyways, going back to this. Um, Luke talks about the way that the other guy believed. The, the one guy believed him and the, and the one guy did not. Whereas Matthew just mentions that they both 
uh, didn't believe him. So this may this obviously sounds like a contradiction because you can't say that one believed in him and one didn't, and also that they both didn't believe him, unless you say that one was making fun of him at first, was ridiculing him at first, and then changed his mind for whatever reason. Is that possible? Have you ever changed your mind? Have you ever been in a life or death situation and your opinion on something changed very quickly, very fast? I can picture this guy joining in, insulting Jesus before they got on the cross, and once he's up there thinking, holy crap, I might have thought this through the wrong way. I can picture that happening. I've been in multiple uh, near-death experiences, <laughs> and my opinion on some things changed very, very quickly. I remember one time, <laughs> I was like, you know, this guy's an idiot, you know, I, I hate him, I hope I never see him again. Something very bad happened. I was like, never mind, he wasn't so bad. I need to go talk to him and make sure everything's cool. <laughs> a good example. But um, So it's it's very possible he changed, he changed his mind for whatever reason. One example of how he could have changed his mind is that Jesus uh, said that he forgave those who were hanging him. Uh, forgive, the, forgive them, they do not know what they're doing. And he could have heard that and said, wow, you know, uh, I, uh, I might have not been real smart on this one and, and changed his mind. Either way... Um, it, we shouldn't throw away the idea that um, that he never repented. I'm dying. I don't have anything else better to do. I'm scared. Just in case, I'm going to get some insurance real quick. Yeah, I mean, that could have happened too. So Matthew 27, 48 says, Immediately one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. So one big question that people have a lot Especially in nowadays, um, anything to really discredit Jesus and that message because it is such an absolute claim. God himself, the only way to heaven. Well, that's a pretty absolute claim. It's hard to get more absolute than that. Um, so obviously the quickest way to um, make it where that's not true would be to discredit Jesus himself. So um, the question being, well, how do we know that Jesus is really dead? And this is something that's been coming up for a long time. And I've got 10 quick things. I'll shoot them through them as fast as I can. First off. The Old Testament predicted death. Number two, Jesus announced uh, that he would die. This is something that he said multiple times if you read the Gospels. Number three, all of the predictions were ba about what would happen were based on his death. So like, for instance, when it talked about, when Jesus talked about him being resurrected, you can only be resurrected if you've actually, you know, died. Number four, the extent of his injuries argues that he died. I mean, if you think about it, just the process that he went through, not sleeping, uh, not eating, carrying a cross, fainting, being hung on the cross, having uh, being beaten, having your beard ripped out, having a crown put on your head, uh, having to lift yourself up every single time to take a breath all day in the sun with no water. That sounds like it's very painful. And then being stabbed in the side with a spear. I I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, yeah, he didn't make it. But, you know, this is my opinion. Number five. How crucifixions are carried out results in death. Crucifixions never resulted in anything else besides death. They were very hard on the body. This isn't like, oh, uh, I'm going to go in for surgery in the morning. I'll be walking home in the afternoon. No, that's, that's not how this goes. Uh, number six, Jesus, um, Jesus was pierced in his side, resulting in blood and water, a very important detail, which I'll get to in just a minute. Number seven, Jesus said he was dying, as recorded in Luke 23, 20, 23 46. He actually says... You know, I'm dying, I'm going to give up my spirit now. He literally says this, and the crowd saw the air go out of him. And uh, if you've ever seen a dead body, I have, <laughs> I have, there is definitely something that happens here that you know the person is no longer living. But, you know, I digress. Anyways, um, these weren't, these weren't, these weren't uh, people who didn't know what they're doing. The Roman soldiers pronounced Jesus dead. They've done this before. They know what they're doing. <laughs> they, they checked him. I mean, they, they knew uh, number nine, Pilate double-checked the death before he released him to Joseph of Arimathea. He double-checked that the body was dead. <laughs> so, I mean, this is kind of an important detail. Number ten, oh, uh, then there's obviously the thing, by the way, that, um, well, I'll say it in, with point ten. Point ten, Jesus was wrapped in 75 pounds of cloth and placed in a tomb with no food and water for days and no medical care. And the tomb was guarded by Roman soldiers. <laughs> and the people who wrapped him around could have all attested to this. Remember, if Jesus was alive, they probably would have said something like, yeah, that guy that you have been following and stuff, I know that he wasn't actually dead because I was the one who wrapped him and uh, he didn't die. Nobody had any, had any claims like that. Nobody. 
Um, so anyways, uh, and then number 11, according to medical authorities, this is the Journal of the American Medical Society, an actual legit medical medical journal. It says the evidence points to death, saying that the spear, quote, perforated not only the right lung, but also the pericardium in the heart, and thereby ensured his death. That's a medical journal, and I'm not really going to disagree with them. So those are 11 reasons how we know that Jesus actually did die. In case anybody tries to tell you some bullcrap about, he wasn't really dead. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> See, nowadays, like, you can go a good deal of your life without actually seeing somebody die. Most people. Most of the time. Okay. These people saw people die. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't like, oh, I've never seen somebody die before. It was like, um, a, it was like a whole get together. Town right. Square. Well, not not that bad. But yes. That, well, it's kind of like well, public stony and hanging. Well, that was more that was more um, later on, especially in like the um, the medieval times. They would have that as more of an activity for kids and stuff. Uh, stoning is, it wasn't that it was a it was a, a hey let's have a have a parade. It was an event where um, the community had to bring judgment against the person, so they all had to throw a rock to show that they were passing judgment on the person. Unless they were more no you couldn't it was part of the law you had to to. yeah you had to bear witness against the person yeah one of the choice of whether or not no no the the law the law of this when one of the 613 laws of moses actually says that the entire community has to go and stone the person so do what yes it was one of the 613 uh laws of moses so then why is what different? Why? Uh, so what did, what did that mean exactly? What do you mean? Like, that, that everyone had to bear witness to... So basically... Yeah, what was that supposed to have meant? meant to that you're all saying, yes, that person is guilty. We're all, we are all... Do you think that was most supposed to be meant more of like a government nature rather than a stoning nature? No, it says very clearly that the community uh, is supposed to take the stones and and, stone, and remember at this time Israel didn't have a government, so they had the law that everybody was supposed to follow, and then they had a prophet who led them. This was Moses, and then Joshua was considered a prophet who had of the spirit of Moses, and then uh, after that, when they decided not to follow the law, God raised up uh, leaders called judges. And to lead them out of when they got when they got into trouble, but then that was never a continuous thing. Like the judges didn't serve back to back like a king would. So that went on for about two hundred years, and then finally they're like, you know what? We're done with this crap. Um, we want a king. And God and the prophet at that time, or the judge at that time, his name was Samuel. Um, he says, um, no, this isn't a good thing that you guys want. This isn't this isn't from God. And uh, and so then God goes to goes to Samuel and says. It's not you that they're rejecting as judge. It's me that they're rejecting as king. So go ahead and give them their king that they want, but warn them. And so he gives them this whole big warning about the things that are going to happen if they get a king. And they're like, yeah, we know what we're doing. We want a king. And then all those things that he said was going to happen happened. And then we get first and second, or I mean, first and second kings and first and second chronicles. And you see it just kind of go downhill very quickly until Babylon destroyed the, or I mean, Assyria destroyed the northern half of the empire or kingdom. And then Babylon destroyed the second half. Um, but anyways. But, but then, but, so God said to cast stones on yes. people? He said that we were supposed to stone people? Not we. Not we. Israel. Israel was. Right. Why? Well, I, I never really realized that. I thought that that was like... It was, first off, it wasn't for every sin. Let's just get that out in the open. Because I feel like you're... I, I have a good feeling you haven't actually read the Law of Moses, have you? Okay, so that would probably probably explain a lot of the confusion. So it, there were certain. I've actually tried to find it. I've never looked at it. Find what? Where it has where it lists like the, the laws. Okay, so the laws are actually mentioned in a couple different books. Exodus gives some of the laws, not a whole lot, but just a couple in chapters like twenty, twenty-one, somewhere around there. Um, Leviticus is predominantly laws. Numbers. Well, not much. Of it. Numbers is about half law, half history. And Deuteronomy is called second law, so it's kind of like a reiteration of the law. So it's almost entirely law, but then it has some things that are poetical and historical towards the end and whatnot. Um, but yeah, so anyways, uh, going back to the Gospels. Um, let see. Okay. 
So that was 2748. That takes us to Matthew 2754. And then uh, this is contrasted to Luke chapter 23, verse 47. It says, uh, in Matthew, it says, When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed this, Surely he was the Son of God. But then in Luke, it says, The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. So, what's being said? Well, it seems to me, and I'll say this before I read my notes, it actually seems like Matthew is summarizing what was being said by, so it sounds like there's some back and forth going on. Like, have you ever seen something like really amazing and a couple different people say a couple different things? Like, oh, that was cool. Wow, did you see that? You know, and so they don't. So it, it seems to me like Matthew's more of just like saying, this is part of what they were saying, and Luke's talking about specifically what the centurion said, it seems like, because it says here, when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw, they were terrified and exclaimed. So it seems like he's more summarizing what was being said, surely he was the son of God, whereas in Luke he's specifying the centurion, because once again Luke was written to a uh, to a Greek, or, yeah, a Greek audience, so it's probable that he's saying, okay, well, this is, by the way, what a centurion said. Could it have been two different centurions? No, not not given the context. Well, I mean, it's possible, but very unlikely. It's very unlikely because um, in Matthew it says, the centurion and those with him, implying that there was only one on guard. And then in Luke it says, the centurion again, once again, implying that there was only one on guard. I could be wrong. And that just might be an issue that comes out in translation. But... I don't see in any of the Gospels mention of a whole bunch of centurions being there. I think they all say that there was just one centurion. So, but, you know, that's, I'm not saying that there couldn't have been other centurions. That's possible. Um, so, uh, Mike, Mark says, surely this man... Oh, uh, so, I don't have Mark up here. In Mark, it says, um, surely this man uh, was the Son of God. Whereas in Matthew, it just says, surely he was the Son of God. But uh, Matthew implies still the same thing, the, the, the this man part, because the um, this is, surely this is the Son of God. Um, it, that is the, in the masculine singular, which implies that it, they're talking about Jesus. So uh, Luke may have been paraphrasing or drawing an implication of what was being said. So Matthew's more saying, hey, this is what was saying, what was said. And Luke is more saying, well, this is the implication of what was said, you know, what they were really getting at. Or the man might have said a few different things in his shock and surprise instead of just one thing. I remember many times when I've been in a really um, like exhilarating kind of situation and I've said like a couple different things. So you said, well, Michael said this. Well, well Michael said this. Well, which thing did Michael say? Well, he said both things. I just wanted to emphasize this because it mattered more to me. And I just wanted to emphasize this because it mattered more to me. So Luke is trying to say something different than Matthew. So that's not saying that he made it up. So um, let's see where are we at here. There may have been some imprecision between the Greek it was written in and the probably Aramaic that it was said in, but I don't think so. I think that's just kind of a side note. Matthew 20... Sorry, go ahead. When it comes to the uh, centurions? Uh-huh. Is that what you're about? Well, uh, I was just saying this a minute ago, uh, that uh, they probably spoke in Aramaic at least most of the time, and the Bible, the New Testament was written in Greek, so there might have been some confusion or whatever um the angels and matthew 25 says the angel said to the woman or the women sorry the women do not be afraid for i know that you are looking for jesus who was crucified so then the question being was there one or two angels well matthew doesn't say only one he says the angel said this he doesn't say the angel and only the one angel that was there because there's no other angel he just said the angel said this and uh you can always say that there, when there are two, there is one, which is why I said that you might be right about the centurion. John talks about how many they saw. John specifically says they saw two, two angels, but Matthew doesn't say how many they saw. It just how, it says how many spoke. The angel said to the women. So uh, it seems like the emphasis is a little, just a little bit different. Matthew records just the one who spoke. Maybe there were 30 more angels that nobody, nobody saw. For instance, okay, let me just say this. They didn't have to make themselves visible, right? Angels can be around, go around without being visible, right? So then maybe there was 500 angels, and maybe two of those 500 made themselves visible, and maybe only one of those 500 actually spoke. See what I mean? We, 
my point being, Matthew saying one spoke and Luke saying they saw two, it's not a contradiction. Matthew 28, 9, verses 1 Corinthians 15, 5. This, uh, I'll tr well, it, it might seem a little bit confusing, so I'll try to make it simple. Okay, so Matthew says, Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. And then if you read in 1 Corinthians 15, 5, it says, um, And that Jesus, after he resurrected, that he appeared to Cephas, who's Peter, another name for Peter. Simon is also another name for Peter. Um, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, excuse me. <clears throat> And then he appeared to the twelve. So it sounds like Peter is saying, I mean, Paul is saying that Jesus appeared to Peter first. And it sounds like Matthew is saying that he met with these other people first. And so the question being, who did he meet with first? And uh, Paul mentions Peter first, not as the first one who is who, who Jesus saw when he after he was resurrected, but rather the first person that he wants to mention in his list of people that he is mentioning. If you read through the Gospels, it gives a it gives a it gives an exhaustive list, but none of them say the exhaustive list. They all say a part of it. So you can piece it together like this: the women are going to the tomb. Mary goes a little bit ahead of the rest of the women, and she gets to the tomb first, and she runs into Jesus first. So Jesus actually appears to Mary first. Well, then the rest of the women, Mary runs back and joins with the rest of the women. They come back. And so then Jesus meets with them for the, meets with Mary and the women. This is the second group of people that he met with. Then later, he goes and meets with Peter. Now, if you remember, the women run away, and they go and they they, they run away and they hide. Eventually, they decide, they decide to tell Peter. So they go and tell Peter. Peter runs to the to the uh, tomb, but at this point, it's empty, and I think um, he just sees the 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 cloth. The cloth, I think, is what he finds there. So anyways, uh, eventually, eventually uh, Jesus meets with Peter, and then he meets with two, two apostles, I believe, on the road to uh, Aramath, what? Emmaus. Emmaus, on the road to Emmaus. I believe that that's where that happens. And then he meets, he meets with 20 apostles, and then he meets with 11 apostles, and then he meets with seven apostles, and he meets with all the apostles, and then all the brethren, which is uh, the one in um, the end of the book of Luke. And then he appears to James specifically, who was his brother, who at this point had still not come to believe in him. And then when he saw him, that's when James actually finally got saved. After Jesus' resurrection. How would you like that? Your brother being like, yeah, you're, you're, you're not God, bro. <laughs> like, the whole time. But anyways, and then uh, he meets again with all the apostles. And then he met lastly with Paul. And that is the order of who Jesus appeared with. So who did Jesus appear with for, first? Mary. He appeared, appeared to Mary first. But notice that in, in 1 Corinthians 15, 5, it doesn't actually say that Paul that Peter, that Jesus met with Peter first. It just says that he appeared to Cephas. You know, he's giving a list here. So, uh, the last part, guys, this is the last contradiction in Matthew. We are at the end of the book, guys. Shoo-wee. So it says this, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So, the contradiction here is, if you read in elsewhere, it says to baptize people in the name of Jesus. And here it says to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is included there. And so which is it, Jesus or all three? And the thing is, that's a false, and it's called a, a, a false, um, oh, what is it called? I forget what it's called. I'll say it in, in different terms that I can remember. So Jesus is part of the Trinity, yes? And there is only one God. So you're not baptizing in the name of three different gods, right? We all understand this, yes? Mm -hmm. So... If you're baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, or if you're baptizing in the name of Jesus, there really is no big difference there, just in your wording. But then also, and this is a little bit of homework for you guys, in the part where it says to be baptized in the name of Jesus, something specific is being pointed towards. And I want you guys to, that's a little bit of homework for you guys, to go figure it out for yourself, what is being emphasized in that part. So, um, I don't want to throw away the, the the discovery when you figure it out for yourself. It's, it's you're gonna have, it's gonna be great. It's always great to find something out for yourself. So, 
you know if you can't figure it out after a couple weeks come and ask me and I'll and I'll I'll tell you so the Trinity is not a contradiction it is what is called a mystery there's a lot of times when people think that just because they don't understand something that means it's a contradiction okay so you're saying that there's three gods but you said that there was one God oh, I didn't say that there were three gods it's the Trinity um, a good example that I try to tell people is do you understand theoretical physics by a show of hand, who here understands theoretical physics? No? Does that mean that it's not true? Does that mean Einstein was wrong? Isaac Newton, was he wrong? No? Haven't, haven't we done test after test to show that, by and large, they were wrong? and they, they were right? I mean, Einstein was wrong about it being a static universe, but a lot of the other things he said was right. Right? So, just because you don't understand that, does that mean that it's not true? See, it's a mystery to you, but that doesn't mean that it's a contradiction. Yeah. So let's look at this. Um, we only understand according to what we have seen, even when we're talking about theoretical physics, right? So we can talk about, we can construct something like a computer because we know about the brain. We know how information is processed, and a computer is basically like a non -or a, a non organic brain, right? But we can only ever ever dream things according to what we have seen. I mean, even if you think of modern theories like multiverse, right? That, that there's, there are mul there's multiple dimensions or multiple universes and, and living in parallel to each other. How can we imagine such a concept? Well, because we know the concept of two rooms being next to each other. We know the concept of two houses having the exact same floor plan being built next to each other. We can, we can only imagine those things that we've seen a glimpse of somehow in this life. We, we, we are unable to conjure something that we haven't actually experienced. Like, for instance, everybody understands the word infinity, right? Never ending. You, everybody understands it. But to really understand it, you can't understand it. Because your brain wants to put a limit that somewhere on the edge of space, there is an edge of space, and there is a wall there. Like, in our thinking, we can't actually imagine the idea of infinite. Or if you think of time, right? We have only ever existed inside of time. Well, God stands outside of time. He created time. That means he is timeless. But if we actually stop and try to think that, our brains can't comprehend the idea of existing without time. We always think in terms like this. So what did God do before he created us? See, because we're still, com 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 we still held down with the idea of time. See what I mean? We are only able to... to, to imagine that thing that we have already seen. So when we get to the Trinity, we are looking at something that we haven't seen. We have never seen three persons in one being. We've never seen that. God tells us that he is three in one, but we don't really, con we don't really, comp we don't really understand that. So we try to think of these different examples that will help us understand. Like, okay, God is like an egg. There's a shell, there's the white, and there's the yolk. Well, no, because each of those parts of the egg would have to be the entirety of the egg. Right, but then that still leaves you with the problem that those are three different parts of your bar of your body. You, you got your heart; it's pumping, right? You got your lungs; it's it's taking in air and circulating through your through your body, and then you got your brain, which is processing information. Right, but then at the end of the day, the one of those parts is not the whole brain. So when you're talking about the Trinity, you you're stuck with this with this thing that doesn't make sense to our brain so it seems like a contradiction because we can't understand because there's nothing we can compare it to another thing people say is like a three-leaf clover or whatever it doesn't matter it's like a three-leaf clover well not entirely because each of those leaves would have to be entire entirely the clover but it's not if you take that one leaf by itself it's not but jesus was fully god Whenever. the holy spirit just a second the holy spirit was fully god the father fully god so many gods are there one god but three persons. Well, how does that make sense? Well, once again, this is something we can't understand. Go ahead. One of the illustrations I like to use is the fact that we have a body, we have a soul, and then we have a spirit. Right. If the body dies, I still exist. I'm just, but I'm separate. My spirit is separate from my body. Right. Still, now, see, the, the problem with that is, is twofold. First off, there's a difference between how the Hebrews understood that and how the Greeks understood that. So for, I'll, I'll reduce this to, to a simple form. Some people believe that the soul and spirit was the same thing. And so they only saw people as two-part beings, body, spirit. And then later, there, the three-part being was, was imagined. I believe it was by the Greeks who first imagined that, with it being body, soul, and spirit. So then, you know, you have that 
that con that confusion there, but then it gets even more confusing because in more modern times they see it as something totally different. They see it as evolved brain and then body. And so now there is no sp no spirit or soul in modern thinking. And so they're thinking that you can actually live forever and, you know, transfer consciousness in these different things by more, as you see in science fiction all the time, by more of what happens to the brain. And one of the big things that science fiction likes to do is you could just like remove the brain from the body and continue to exist and all these different things, not realizing that it would still decay even though you might live onwards. Anyways, so... Um, so every single every single example, and then and then another problem with that view is then your body though, your spirit can exist apart from your body. When you die, your body and your spirit will be separated. You or your spirit will be in heaven. Your body will be on earth, dead. It won't be until the resurrection that you're given a new body. So with that being said, they can exist apart from each other. Okay. So Jesus is still fully God, even when he was. As a human, born as a human, he was still fully God. So, I mean, he didn't cease to be God at any point in time. So, you're left with a little bit of a problem there. We have no example that works consistently. We have things that show us pieces, and that's it. Like the, like the baptism, Jesus' baptism after he got out of the water. Um, there was Jesus, and then, of course, the Spirit came down, mm -hmm. and the Father and was speaking, right. Right. So, so there, I think that that helps us to understand more in a way because we understand that God revealed himself in the physical plane. Okay. And so to do that, he used three different approaches. Okay. First off, you can't say that it's the same God putting on different faces because then you've gotten rid of the, rid of the, rid of the persons of the Trinity. Okay. Yeah. That's actually what's called modelism. And it was taught uh, actually during the medieval days. And they taught that that it was there was one God, not three persons, one God who appeared at different as different. He either appeared as Jesus, appeared as the Father, appeared as the Holy Spirit. Well, the problem then being, you have all three of them showing up at the baptism, and doesn't make and quite make sense. But see, one thing that makes that easier for us to understand is because they they were showing up in different ways. Jesus showed up as a human, the Holy Spirit showed up as a dove. And the Father didn't actually make his presence known because, once again, nobody has actually seen the Father, right? So he spoke. So you have a little bit of a problem there. So, anyways, uh, so I'll, I'll, now that we now that I've kind of I think really hammered in the idea of a mystery is not a contradiction, let's try and 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 wrap this up as quickly as we can. Uh, no, no, that was that was me. That wasn't you. Um, where am I at here? Um, okay, so the core is usually based on the adaptation of the normal like. The Trinity is like so-and-so. So, um, okay, I already said that about the multiverse. Okay, so God is one essence, three persons. One nature, three centers of consciousness. One what, three who's. One it, three eyes. A contradiction is, is God is one person and three persons, but that's not what the Bible teaches. The concept of Trinity is taught, and I just want to throw this out there. You will never find the word Trinity in the Bible. That is because this is a man-made word to, to describe something that the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches the Trinity. It doesn't teach the word the Trinity. We do this with a lot of different things, right? So uh, uh, the Bible talks about speaking in tongues. Well, we more have talked, say, speaking in tongues in, in the Pentecostal movement, more so than the Bible says. It usually says gifts of the Spirit and stuff like that. See what I mean? So we kind of, we kind of, and it does say speaking in tongues in some parts, but not in every part. And so there, there's there's things where, where we've created words to explain a concept, but that doesn't mean that the concept is, is created. Um, another good example is, uh, no, I'm not going to use that one. Okay. So that takes us all the way through, all the way through the Gospel of Matthew. Wow, <laughs> there are a lot of contradictions that uh, that we looked at, guys, and uh, quote, unquote. quote unquote contradictions. And uh, I, I like the way that um, that could have actually been two separate lessons, and I made it into one freaking long lesson. You know, just in case you didn't have anything else to do with your life. Uh, any questions about the contradictions in the Gospels before we wrap this up?
I don't have any questions, but I think um, I think written clause is a question that I could slam into or ask the question. Right, but you have to keep in mind that if we were talking to talk about the law, I mean, we'd be here for like another hour and a half, and uh, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> yeah, I'm tired. I, you know, I after the at the by the end of the day, honestly, I started cocking out about halfway through the lesson, and I was like, just keep your focus, and we can finish up contradiction er, the contradictions in Matthew tonight. So, uh, we can talk about the law some other time. Like, if you want, we I can even like prepare a whole uh, a whole series on it because there are a lot of questions about the law nowadays. There's questions about. Yeah. Is after we're done with contradictions, we could do something on Leviticus. Yeah. Uh, now, do you want to do? Do you want to do the laws as a whole, or specifically Leviticus? Well, the laws would help a lot too. Okay. But specifically Leviticus, because it confuses me so much. Right. Like I can read it, and I don't understand it one bit. Yeah. Well, it's one of those things where if you don't understand it, it's hard to understand Christianity. Now, the New Testament doesn't reiterate the Old Testament. It assumes knowledge of the Old Testament. So if you notice, Jesus doesn't say anything about homosexuality. Why is that? Because it was already covered in the Old Testament. He didn't, he didn't rewrite every single moral law in the history of the world. You see what I mean? He, based, he went on based on the knowledge that you already have the Old Testament. Now let me bring the conclusion to the law. And another thing that people do oftentimes is they make the mistake of thinking that the Old Testament law was, was how things were supposed to be done. Like social reform. Like this is how we need to do things in order to, to fix, fix the world. If we would just do things, how would they do it in the law? No. Another thing that people do that, 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 that's wrong is they try to still follow the law nowadays. Like... Jesus' death meant nothing. It's like, well, <laughs> that's not how it really works. Um, but anyways, you know, there's little things. Little things, I guess. Yeah, we could probably... Uh, do what? But I wonder how the people before Jesus still not having, like, being part of, like, being that part of the Old Testament. Well, see, that's one of the things that Jesus talks about is the way that it was, or actually Paul talks more about it, but Jesus does talk about it a little bit. Uh, the way that it was meant to point forward to the coming of the Christ. But instead, the Pharisees said, the law is perfect and complete. It's all we need. It's fine. We don't even need a Messiah to do anything except for really overthrow the government. That's really all we need We need the Messiah for. And it's so funny that they believe a prophet is real and true. We heard from God. Oh, this is heard from God. I believe this guy, but not... Well, I think that's because Moses came with a lot of signs. So, well, no, because Jesus did too. Yeah, that's what I, I was going to say. Right? Jesus did too. Well, they, they, didn't, they didn't believe because they, they had an expectation that he would. Oh, you know, another thing I wanted to point out. Blasphemy, right? They knew, they knew that, it was, that it was blasphemous because they knew that whether or not he was true, whether or not they were admitting to themselves that it was true, they just didn't care. Because they, they wanted the government a specific way. No, no, no. When they blasphemed, what they were doing was they was they were attributing the power of the Holy Spirit to the demonic realm. That's what the blasphemy is that they were doing. So they're, they're, Jesus is doing these things, and, and they say and they make the comment, "He does this, but he but does this by the power of Satan." And it was but obvious. Is it, is it because they knew better? Well, they knew better that it wasn't from Satan. That's what I mean. Right. So they, they, knew, they knew that the power wasn't from Satan, but for various reasons, they were attributing it to Satan. But that's what I mean. Like, so that, that was the whole thing when it came to like, Jesus. That the whole thing was like the blasphemy, whether or not they admitted to themselves or anyone that Jesus came from God. Their whole thing was, well, I don't really care. I don't need to look into that. I don't care if it's true or not. Probably is. Maybe it isn't. I don't really care. The whole point is, is he can overthrow the government. So well, like, not, we're going to just like... Not entirely, no. Um, their their main perp their main point uh, of contention with him was more on religious grounds. Um, for instance, the Pharisees thought that they were perfect, and if you look at what Jesus taught and what the Pharisees taught, they almost they taught they believed almost the exact same thing. The only real difference between Jesus and the Pharisees is Jesus talked about the heart, and the Pharisees ignored the heart. <laughs> so Jesus told them, you know, hey, you guys are you guys are whitewashed tombs. You, you, it looks real great up here, but there's only dead bones inside. And they're like, no, we're good and perfect. And you have this whole element of pride. And you see, this still happens today. 
pastors and, and, and people in ministry, you know, you do ministry for a couple of years, try it sometime, do it for a couple of years, and you get start thinking, I'm better than people. I'm better than other people. I have it all under control. And then somebody comes to you and says, you know, um, Brittany, you're doing this, and, and that's wrong. You need to stop doing that. You get kind of like defensive, like, no, I'm righteous. You don't know what you're talking about. You know what I mean? And it's just this kind of arrogance that comes over you when you serve God for so long that you think you know it all, you know? And um, so when they were trying to make Jesus the, the king, that was actually the common people that were doing that. And the people who were blaspheming against the Holy Spirit was actually the Pharisees. So those are two different groups of people um, at the two different times. So um, the Pharisees were, 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 were trying to discredit Jesus because they, they had a whole power trip thing going on. And well, so that's and they hated him, so. yeah, and they hated him. Well, not all of them, but <laughs> by and large, <laughs> there was a. Well, so mainly it was because not because of anything. They just thought, well, we can't believe this guy because he's telling us that we're not perfect, which means that you know. We're well, more. it's hard to condense this the the complexity of people into a simple statement of oh, this is why. That is I would say that, yes, some people probably did it because they didn't want to lose their power. I would say some people did it and probably did it because they wanted to believe that they were good enough. But I think at the core of it, it's kind of human nature to not believe in Jesus. And I'll, I'll tell you what I mean, okay? I've been in church. Also, well, hold on just a minute, just a minute. I've been in church my whole life. And something that I've seen across the board in Christians is this. I was saved by grace. I continue to be saved by my good works. So Jesus got me in the door, but it's up to me to be good enough to stay in the door. I've seen that throughout my entire life in the church. Christians trying to be good enough so that God will accept them when they're already accepted by God. They already accepted Jesus. And that's basically the same thing. What I was going to say is, like, also, as, like, a Christian, you know, the Mosaic Law stuff came first, whereas, like, before that, they probably didn't have much of, like, a godly law or anything and once you accept something in the door once there's already a ground for something mm -hmm. it's hard to knock it all down and have something else or add to it or change it or anything i mean I that's mean, true look, look at us we're, we're still like the constitution was made for a reason guys you don't need to change any of that like you know what i mean it's, right. it's hard to do that like right. for, for people to do it so that was probably another reason they were just like well it already is the way it is mm. i mean yeah it, it is hard to change something that's this is just the way we do things. Uh, actually, one of the hardest things, I didn't think it was going to be this hard, but when I first uh, uh, became a pastor, one of the hardest things is changing something in a church because people say something like, well, that's the way we've always done it. Why are you changing that? We've always done it like that. And it's like, well, because it's not really effective anymore. That's how they did things back in the 30s. And we're not in the 30s anymore. Well, we're almost in the 30s again. How about that? <laughs> Well, anyways, uh, any uh, questions about the contradictions in the Gospels? No?